Thank you, everybody. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Matt Zoller Seitz. Matt? And would you please join us in welcoming Chaz Ebert? Um, it's tough for you every time you watch that movie, huh? Every single time. And as I sit here, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I'm so glad that you are showing it here. Uh, and I have some friends in the audience who were actually at our wedding. And uh, they live here in East Hampton. And I'm glad that they got to see it. But it is weird to sit here. I, I can't lie to you, it's weird to sit here and talk about the movie. I didn't realize that until, I don't know, it gets me every single time I see it. And sometimes I can't even watch it. I just go out while they show the movie and I'll come back for Q&A. The reason that I do like to talk about it is because I, I thank you for honoring him and his legacy and the things that he brought to film criticism and his joy of life. Just, he was just so, he was a joyous man. He was full of joy. The day that he passed away, I had actually gone to the hospital to take him home because he was getting better. We didn't know he was leaving that day. Anyway, you, this is a Q and A. <laughs> so you keep going, baby, you keep going. It's working. No, but, wait, but, but you met him, how long did you know him before you got married? You met, obviously, in the 12-step program, as you say, and you knew him how long before you got married? Uh, we were together for 24 years and married for 21 years. So you were just three years, then you got married. So you were together for 24 years. Yes. Now, one thing, because we, we've got a bunch of questions from Matt, as well, who was a critic, and we're going to go into his bio in a moment. But uh, Chaz, I wanted to ask, uh, you assume that someone, you know, you know, a lot changed during his career. You look at this footage. This is actually a question for both of you. I have to make sure my phone is off. So okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, the, uh, a lot changed. When you look at this footage, you see how dated this is. You see these guys did this, and they put, I mean, I'm, 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 sim I'm simplifying this, but they put print critics out of business, and then, I mean, I think that we know the obvious answer, but I wanted to hear Matt talk about who put them out of business. They, they were put out of business. This, this show ended, not, not just because of their health, but other people did the show, Roper and so forth, and other people have done that show. What is criticism now, and why don't we have those shows now? Can I, before you say that, I just have to say one thing. They didn't put print critics out of business. They actually expanded the market. They created a cottage industry of film criticism Film criticism didn't exist like it did before Siskel and Ebert. Um, he was in, syndicated in over you know, 200 newspapers, and so it wasn't him putting print critics out of business. Just have you think to he elevated that. all that? Okay. Yeah, he, he actually expanded it. And also, the show would have continued to go on, but, um, you know, but uh, because, because of his illness, uh, that's why when the show stopped. So the illness so. really was the biggest impact. Yes. What do you think about that? Well, I agree with that. And in, in, in fact, I, I've talked about Siskel and Ebert, all the different incarnations. As you know, it had many different names. Um, when they left public television and they went into syndication, well, first they, ch they changed the name three or four different times, I think. And every time that they, they sort of changed the, the name of the show, the, the venue of the show, um, there would be more sort of people who were going to be Siskel and Ebert. There were duos all over the country. There were national people, there were lo regional people, local people. None of them had the impact of Siskel and Ebert. So, so I, I personally feel like it was a singularity. And I think it was the chemistry of those particular two guys. And it wasn't that they, neither of them were, at the beginning at least, polished television personalities. But it was the energy and the authenticity that they had together and the unusual nature of that energy that made it popular. 
And, uh, and that and the fact that, as more than one person said, including Scorsese in the film, uh, what they both did was they made it possible for someone to read a movie, to understand a movie, even if they didn't go to film school, even if they didn't know a lot about film history. They demystified criticism and, and democratized it, which is kind of an amazing thing. And I don't think any of the shows that came after did that. What was his consumption? And come on, you give us an honest insight into this now. You're his wife. What was his consumption of other entertainment and media? Was he a TV person? Did he watch TV? Was he a purist about films? Did he only like cinema and going to the movies? Did he watch TV at home? I mean, I mean films at home? What did he think about the way people consume films now? Well, we, yeah, we watched, we watched, we had a little theater in our house and we watched uh, films. He actually, he, he really loved films. The other things, he didn't watch much television except for, we liked sort of talking head political shows uh, and um, you know shows like Charlie Rose. We also, we went to theater a lot, we liked theater, and we liked the opera. Um, our first date was at the Lyric Opera, I think we saw Tosca. Um, so that's, that's what we did, and he read, he was a prodigious reader, and so he was always reading when he wasn't writing and with our grand, I don't, and sometimes I wondered how many Rogers were there because he did so much of everything. He really did grab life with both hands, so. No Sopranos, no you know, The Wire. He, let me see, let me see. You can I, just say 30 Rock, no, it's okay. No <laughs> 30 Rock, no oh, Jeopardy. Oh, oh, oh Jeopardy. I am so, oh yeah, 30 Jeopardy. Rock, of course. Uh, yes, Come he did. On. No Wheel of Fortune, any guilty pleasures there, no? Mm. No, he wasn't a TV watcher. He did watch some television. Uh, you were out most nights. <laughs> Saturday Night Live, I guess, I don't okay. know. Okay, okay, David, go ahead. No, I mean, I, I was curious too about some of the stuff that he watched, but um, how many times have you seen the film now, Chaz? I mean, this must have been 10 times or so at this point, and... No, no, I, I, I have not watched it that many times. I've gone around to talk about it, but like I said, I, I know within the first five minutes of watching whether I can sit through it or not. Sometimes I hear the beginning music, and it's so sad, I just turn around and leave the theater. One day, though, I did have an experience where I was watching it, and all of the humor came through, the things with he and Gene Siskel and... You know, I'm so sorry that someone called his earlier girlfriend psychos and gold diggers because I knew some of them and they were not. Um, but um, tonight I wanted to watch it because I was sitting with friends and, and, um, and just because I miss him. So I wanted to see him on the screen. Yeah, Matt, you're the TV critic for New York Magazine currently, correct? Yes, uh-huh. And, and how long have you been doing that? I've been doing that for about two and a half years, but I've, I've been a film critic. Uh, I've been doing criticism in some form or another for tw uh, about 25 years, and for much of that time, I've been a television critic and a film critic simultaneously for different venues. And you were a finalist. We have to also mention Roger won the Pulitzer Prize, and you were a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for criticism. I was, yeah, 20 years as ago. As well, yeah. And, and, for, and for you, is it something that you jump uh, pretty comfortably back and forth between TV and film? Or yeah. do you prefer one over the other? No, it's, it's well, it's funny because I, I remember when I was writing, I was a television critic for the Star-Ledger for uh, 11 years, which that's the paper that Tony Soprano picked up at the end of his driveway. <laughs> and uh, it was a very exciting uh, paper to be writing about television at when the Sopranos came on. But, and I was a, a film critic for New York Press during that same period. And I remember, uh, at that particular time, this was kind of the last gasp of cinema snobbery, and a lot of my colleagues would kind of chide me a little bit because I was a television critic and like, oh, go off and write about your, your shows, your stories, uh, as if I was my grandma or something. And, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to see that now the conversation has shifted a little bit where we're treating television as an evolving art form. And, and I like to tell people that I think cinema Cinema had a 50-year head start on movies, and I think movies, uh, television is at approximately the point where movies were in the late 60s and early 70s, which is a pretty great place to be. And what is it going to become eventually? I don't know. But this 
discussion of is television the new movies or is television better than movies? I don't think it is, but I think it's in the same way that uh, I, you know, my my ten year old son can't beat me at basketball. You know, I mean, it's just it's a matter of evolution. Oh, and I do. I, I you reminded me of something. Roger was actually one of the first people, one of the first critics to start um, reviewing. Uh, you know, from cable, from TV things, and people say, well, why don't you just write about the movies? Isn't that sort of, and he said, no, it's really all the same. It's storytelling. They and reviewed Hill Street Blues when it premiered, yes, and they reviewed right. Twin Peaks. They would occasionally review right. television shows. And I remember Gene Siskel complaining uh, that Hill Street Blues was not that big a deal because they were just stealing from Robert Altman. Now, Matt, we talked backstage a little bit. We talked about how um, uh, Steve uh, James, who made this film, made the documentary Hoop Dreams, and 20 years before this movie was made. So that you were talking about this kind of karmic uh, you know, circle where it comes back around, where now uh, Hoop Dreams, which was a film that Ebert helped make successful, uh, he was uh, someone that shined a light on these uh, uh, less uh, well-known films and had weaker marketing budgets and so forth and drew people's attention to Errol Morris, who you saw on screen and so forth, and really helped launch the careers of some of these people by shining that light on there. Um, and you were saying how, uh, for you, in your experience as a critic, and I'll let you say it in your own words, you, you feel that's your job, is to cast, you, you yourself feel the same uh, yeah, desire. I do. I do. I think it's important, and it's something that I, I write about quite a bit. Um, there's a tendency, I think, especially if you are a critic, and that's your job, to to treat it as a job, and to to uh, sometimes take the kind of um, make the kind of decisions that one would make if you were just thinking about it as a job. By which I mean, you you want the prestige of writing about the big films, which usually means the studio films or the independent films that have won an award at a major festival or a documentary that's up for an Oscar or something like that. I don't see a lot of critics out there in big major positions who are spelunking, who are kind of getting down on their hands and knees and digging around in the mud and finding the obscure movies, the gems. That's something that Roger and Gene did. And you mentioned Hoop Dreams. I first learned about Hoop Dreams, the same place that a lot of other Americans did, which was watching Siskel and Ebert's show. They reviewed it. It was the top of their broadcast. It was the first film. They always put a, 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 the, the wow film in that first spot, and it was Hoop Dreams, and it was the week it was opening at Sundance. There were like 400 people who could see Hoop Dreams. They made a statement with that. They decided to make that movie, and they made that movie, and they did it with Gates of Heaven, which we saw here. Um, I wrote a... Uh, paper on Gates of Heaven in college, the Earl Morris documentary about pet, pet cemeteries. My professor assigned it to everybody in this film class, and uh, I did not rebel against it because I watched Siskel and Ebert, and I knew that they had reviewed it three times, and they thought it was one of the great films of the 80s. <laughs> and there was a lot of examples of that kind of thing. And, and the, the, I guess what I'm getting at is the tail wags the dog entirely too much in criticism. There's too much. There's too much. Too many decisions are made on what to cover based on what we think people want to hear about, and what we think they expect to hear about. That's why there's 25 stories a day about the new Star Wars movie, and there's 10 stories a day about the new superhero movie, and all of that. And here's pictures of Godzilla. I love those movies, but there's more to cinema than that, and we have to go out and find it and show it to people. So someone wants to me. Oh, no, please go ahead. Go ahead. <clears throat> Someone once told me that, that uh, 30 years ago, if you walked into a major studio and said, I got a great idea, and that we're going to spend a lot of money, we're going to risk a lot of money on this, but we're going to do a movie. In fact, if it goes well, we're going to do a series of movies. We do four or five movies based on Spider-Man. And in that gag, you'd see the body of that person go, <laughs> and get thrown out the door of the studio and go crashing in the parking lot. And now the opposite is true. Now you walk into the office and you, if you pitch anything that isn't Spider-Man, you go <laughs> and they give you the boot out of the building and you get hurled cartoon style out of the, out of the building. Go ahead. You, I, well, I was going to say, I was, uh, I, uh, this book, I'm writing this book about the films of Oliver Stone, which is going to be out next year. And Oliver, you, who you've worked with, 
is at a very interesting place. He's kind of in the grand old man phase of his career where he's kind of traveling around the world getting lifetime achievement awards. But at the same time, he's trying to get his films made. And he was telling me, very frankly, it's harder than it's ever been for a guy like him to get the kind of films made that he makes. And he, Spike Lee and Oliver Stone were both at Ebert Fest. And uh, uh, Spike Lee was there for the 25th anniversary of Do the Right Thing. Roger, and uh, um, Oliver was there for the 25th anniversary of Born on the Fourth of July, two great American films released by major studios, both by Universal. Um, neither of those movies, I think, would get made at that budget level now, at a comparable budget level. And he said that he and Spike Lee, I wish I'd been a fly on the wall for this, were commiserating over this, saying there's no place for guys like us anymore in this economy, the superhero, I call it the superhero-based economy. One of the reasons, um, when Roger passed away, I became the uh, publisher and, uh, of RogerEbert.com and the CEO of all of our companies, the Ebert Company, uh, Ebert Digital, and when he knew he was ill, he told me, keep these things going, but only if you really want to. And I had been in, we had been in business together for over 20 years, in addition to being married to each other. And one of the things that I made a, a vow to do with RogerEbert.com is to continue to do not only blockbuster movies, but it's important to me to have the foreign films, to have documentary films. I think docs are some of the most exciting cinema around. Um, to have independent films and a diversity of films. So what we did is we used to highlight about six or seven movies a week. And I actually expanded that to 13 movies a week, which is actually a lot to write about. And I don't know anyone else who's writing that, that often that many movies, but that's because I want to give our, my writers a chance uh, and, and um, to, to find gems and to highlight them the way that, that Roger used to do. And I think Matt is doing a, a very good job uh, with us at RogerEbert.com. He's my editor-in-chief. Uh, well, I just should say that um, when I and the, and the managing editor said we should um, cover everything that is opening in national release, and that meant doubling the number of reviews that we had budgeted, uh, Chaz said yes, because we thought it was important and she didn't hesitate. Uh, no, well, it's actually a little different. Well, <laughs> what, what do you yeah. think is driving, uh, I mean, other than the superhero thing, which is of course doesn't uh, account for all the films that are made, what do you think is driving um, the, uh, I have my notes in my phone here. Um, what do you think is driving films that the studios make. Uh, I remember that a period when the studios wanted stars to tentpole films, if you will, that were not superhero films. And I mean, it wasn't as bad as this. I mean, I've made this joke maybe even on this stage in this program before. But I remember a period of time when they, you'd be in meetings with the studio and they'd say, well, we're going to do the story of Thomas Jefferson. and. Uh, of course, we've got to get somebody uh, just perfect to play Sally Hemings, uh, his black uh, mistress. And uh, uh, who do you think we should get? And the studio would say, well, we're going to get Sandra Bullock to play uh, uh, Sally <laughs> Hemings. Uh, she'd be great in that part. She would just nail it. Um, uh, but it doesn't matter. You know, I know what you're thinking, but it doesn't really matter. We're going to work all that out. And, uh, and it's just like the, just the, the idea, the, 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 the superimposition or the insistence of stars to play these roles, whether they were right for these roles or that not. That great scene in The Player, Bruce Willis. Right, right. And I mean, that, that's kind of died down now, and a lot of people who are, had careers in which their names attached to a film uh, wouldn't guarantee things, but they were good leverage in terms of that investment for them. That seems to be dissolving as well. Do, would you agree? Yeah, I do. Who and makes money and who doesn't is kind of like completely amorphous now. Well, I think that the, that the, the transformation of movies into product has reached a kind of an end game. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but I think the fact that movies are shot on video instead of film now gives the studios a bit more control over it. Um, the fact that I, I just How found so? out, well, for one thing, you can't keep a secret what you're shooting. You can't, you can't, you know, it used to be that before the days of a video tap, you shot it, you hoped it turned out well, and you looked at the dailies the next day to see if it happened. And um, 
it, studios, particularly for the tentpole films like superhero movies and big big blockbusters, they're insisting on everything being covered with multiple cameras. So if they don't like the way the director is directing it, they can recut it a different way. Um, and also, the movies are being distributed, via, you know, as downloads. Like they're not physically shipping the prints anymore. They're and and uh, it makes it easier to control the the you know what theaters get the get the film keep track of uh, the tickets that are being sold and everything else. And it's just, it's, it's kind of a digital data stream. And I think that the devaluing of stars is a part of that because we used to make fun of the idea that uh, stars drove everything. And I think that was true at a certain point, but it's not true anymore. And I think the studios breathe a huge sigh of relief. And, and we make fun of the idea that, uh, oh, well, we'll cast Julie Roberts and everything. We'll cast Bruce Willis and everything. That was the joke in the movie, The Player. Um, but if you look at the movies that Bruce Willis and Julie Roberts have been associated with throughout a lot of their career, there, there was a certain level of quality control there. And, and I think that um, when you cut the actors out as power players, which is what's happening now, the studios have more control. They, it's almost a process of like making the director less powerful, the star less powerful, everybody less powerful. The studio is the filmmaker The now. studio is the filmmaker now. The studio it, is the filmmaker now. Yes, and the Marvel films, uh, I wrote a piece complaining about how all these superhero movies, that all the action films look the same, and I wanted to go to the concession stand during the action scene, which if you'd said to me as a kid, someday you will go to the concession stand during the action scene, I would say, you're crazy. But that's what's happening. And I was told by a number of people who work on these movies that the studio has the action scenes written out and designed, and the director has almost nothing to do with them. Well, you, you raise an interesting point. I don't want to beat this to death because we're going to take a couple of questions because it's getting late. But uh, the, the, you raise a very interesting point, which is true, which is the quality control that was maintained or that was part and parcel of the star-driven system. Now, this isn't true, certainly, of all stars of films, but most of them, I think, are pretty conscientious people. Julia Roberts made a lot of good films, and you know, she's a wonderful actress. And what I found was when those people went to work, they wanted good people with them to make the film. I mean, on every level. I mean, even I remember one time I had this very strange experience, and I don't mean to be self-referential, but I remember I did a film, and they said, you're going to go do this crime drama down in New Orleans in the middle of the summer, and you're going to be running through the streets of New Orleans with a gun in your hand, and we're going to get a local dolly grip. Because I knew a guy who was like, the, he was the number one dolly grip in, in, in Los Angeles, Mike O'Brien. And this guy, he was the guy. I mean, oddly enough, his... Uh, uh, his wife was a wardrobe woman I worked in the business, and I'd worked with Mike before. And she said, uh, you're going to, uh, and I went to the producer, I go, who's your dolly grip? Are you going to bring an L.A. dolly grip to New Orleans? We have to fly the guy there and put him up in a hotel and him. They said, oh, no, no, no. I said, you're doing an action film in the middle of July in New Orleans, and we're going to be running with guns in our hands and jumping on streetcars and all this crap, and you're, gonna bring, you're not going to bring in L.A. a real top-notch dolly grip? They said, no, no, no. I said, I ain't doing the movie. I'm going home. And they flew him down there, and they put him in a hotel, and they made him the dolly grip to... Because this is a guy that knew how to push this goddamn... He was this big, tough NFL-looking guy to push the dolly grip. And that happens in makeup. That happens in editing. I mean, not all actors walk onto the set and have this precious attitude about things. It's all about, I want all the beige M&Ms taken out of the M&M <laughs> container. Like this crap you hear about the Eagles on tour or something, you know? They, 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 it's none of that. They come in and they go, who's the editor, who's the customer, who's the lighting, who's the DP, who's, you know, who, who are beyond hair and makeup, because most stars bring their own hair and makeup. And now that the studio, because everybody knows, all actors know that the studio wanted to get rid of stars. Because stars break up with their boyfriends, and stars go to rehab, and stars have their period and won't come out of their trailer. <laughs> and stars, and, and, when, and, when, and when you can get anybody, when you can get, you know, a... Uh, 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 you know, Juliana Roberts, or you can get Pedro Clooney, or you can get somebody else to do the film. Let's get somebody who costs one-tenth what they cost. I really wish Pedro Clooney was a real person. Though. He's going to be now. That's, my, that's our name under the hotel, honey. Pedro Clooney. We're going to stay in hotels under Pedro Clooney. Did you have a question? No, I was just going to say, I think since it's moved away from the star system, it really seems to be more what they call IP, intellectual property, that everyone's fighting over. Yes. I mean, you can make um, The Fault in Our Stars or in Fifty Shades of Grey with, you know, us in the leads, and people are going to still buy tickets because everyone who read those books wants to see it, or Lego movie, or whatever. I mean, these are, it's there's the IP. Five, there's like five books or ten books in a series, and you can expand it even further by breaking up the book into two movies, which has been done with a lot of these films. Yeah, so I think it's really, these days, it's the intellectual property and the race for that more than it is for the Pedro Clooney. What, what did you learn? If, because, well, I, I mean, I could go on and on, and we, but we got a late start at 8 o'clock here, but 
What did you learn, uh, if you can say, if, if I'm assuming there was something, about movies and watching movies from your husband? What did he impart to you about that? Um, did he teach you how to watch a movie, or were you a big movie buff before that? Well, or? I was a big movie buff before Roger. That's one of the reasons that we got along so well. But I did learn, uh, you know, what I, what I actually learned about him in reading his reviews is how important empathy was, and that um, you don't watch a movie, if you're gonna give two hours of your life to a movie, it has to be about something, that the storytelling is important, but also that it's important to have a little empathy to learn what it feels like to be a person of another gender, of another race, of another age, of another uh, physical ability, and uh, that sometimes it's not just about entertainment. What's the worst thing you ever wrote about someone in a review? You don't have to name names. What's the worst? I'll tell you the worst thing you ever said about me in a review. <laughs> I hope I didn't write it. Oh, I'll say it. You tell me if you wrote it. <laughs> what is it? I, th I think somebody once wrote something like, what I really would hope after watching this movie was that Mr. Baldwin's character would jump out the window of a building and the character would land on Mr. Baldwin. <laughs> Did you, write, did you write that? I didn't, I didn't the write that. The character in the film would kill the actor who portrayed him. They both oh. die in the same thing. But the, but the fact that you were Mr. Baldwin on second reference tells me it was the New York Times. It may, it may be. It may be. I would say the worst, probably the worst thing I ever wrote about a film or a filmmaker was uh, the movie Irreversible. Uh, which I, I know a lot of people love that movie, but I hated it. And, uh, and I think the last line in my review was... Uh, if I ever, uh, I, I hope that someday I meet this filmmaker so that I can punch him in the face because turnabout is fair play. It's okay. a, if you've seen the movie, you know what I mean. It's, a, it's basically the movie is just beating you on the head for two hours. Fantastic. Anything? We have mics out there. Anybody have any questions? We're going to take a couple questions. Yes. Yes, let's get a mic down here. Chaz, I was curious, you, there was a song, Leonard Cohen song, that was kind of your song. Was there a film that you and Roger had some sort of special connection with or that you, was your film? Um, yeah, there's a Henry is Jaglin. Is it irreversible? No. <laughs> no, it's not irreversible. <laughs> I hope not. There is a Henry Jaglum film, um, but I can't remember the name of it, when he goes to... Somewhere in the Hamptons? No. <laughs> did make the movie Somewhere in the Hamptons, but I don't think that. Anyway, you know, I can't remember the name of it. And there's also a film by Paul Cox called Innocence that we love. It's um, um, a couple in their 20s who fall in love, but they, their parents don't want them to get married. And when they're in their 60s or 70s, they get together again. And um, it, it, it's called Innocence by Paul Cox. Um. Another couple questions over here, anyone? Anyone? You just want to get this over with so you can go over to Cheetah Nuova? There we go. Like, you know, did you uh, both um, enjoy the same type of music? Because in the film, it, it showed, like, you know, he really had an appreciation of music, and, and that was uh, a big joy in his life, it seemed. We both had an eclectic taste in music. We both liked all kinds of music, opera, soul R&B, um, rap, classical music. We, we, when he, before he would go into the hospital, he would download about a thousand songs in his iPod and just play them. He had music all around and I knew that when he was leaving that he would really appreciate going out to Dave Brubeck. You know, I was struck by this is the fifth time, fifth time I've seen this movie, um, fourth time with an audience, and I'm always struck by, each time I'm more struck by the music. And not just the, the way the film uses music, but the way that Roger used music in his life. And it was almost like, there's a line in there where it's like he was the director of the film of his life. And, I, and there are times when I think, like, yeah, and he's even, he's even got a soundtrack. <laughs> it's incredible. I mean, and, that, and that the, to me, the peak of the whole movie is that Steely Dan moment. That, that captures the spirit of the guy that in the last few months of his life was still writing this amazing prose and doing 16 different things. And in fact, every time I see this movie, it makes me, and I've said this to a lot of people, but um, 
I feel like I'm going to have to watch this movie once a month for the rest of my life because whenever I reach sort of a, a, a trough, like not a crest, but a trough emotionally, uh, like when I'm thinking like I can't do everything that I'm doing, I look at this and it's like, yeah, you can. <laughs> yeah, you can. You know, actually, I feel that th the same way. Even though we lived in the house together and we saw each other every day, it wasn't until the first time I saw a clip from this movie that I realized how sick he was. And it may, you, may, you may think, well, why not? But it really, he was just, every day, he, he didn't really let things get him down and he would just keep going. And I knew it was difficult for him, but, um, and I always thought he was brave and he would say, oh, don't say that, what choice do I have? And I said, some people give up. Everybody, you know, you, you do a lot of things that other people, some other people wouldn't do, but when I saw the clip in the hospital and I thought, I never really thought of him as sick. So, um, anyway. Anyone? We will take this gentleman here, then we'll, be, then we'll finish, then I have one, one last comment. You know, what made him laugh, or who was his favorite comedian, or you know, what really brought out that laughter that really, you know, all of us bubble up with eventually? Who do you think was funny? Um, I know That's so binary, you know, you're like, who's he funny? Liked, it's... He liked George Carlin. Right. Um, he liked, um, he probably liked a lot of political humor. Right. So, um... Did he watch Colbert and... He, oh, yeah, he did. He, you know, a, a Daily Show and that kind of thing, he liked that kind of thing? He did. He actually thought you were funny on your Monsieur Capretz, I think, uh, Saturday Night Live. He did? That? He did, Oh, yes. thank God. <laughs> we wrote that with him in mind. Now, before we go, uh, uh, we uh, two things. Our next screening is when, Monsieur? Uh, July 25th. Keep on keeping on. It's a 7.30 screening. Yeah, we're going to do July 25th. And tell, tell us about the film. It's a little bit about the film. Uh, sure. It's about Clark Terry, the uh, legendary uh, trumpet player. Uh, it's produced by Quincy Jones. And it's about Clark Terry having been mentored when he was a young man and about how he is now mentoring a young piano player. And it's incredibly moving. It won the Audience Award at the Tribeca Film Festival this year. And it's fantastic. I think people are going to love it. Before we go, I wanted to ask Matt uh, uh, and anybody on the, uh, on the panel here who wants to say something. Uh, to make a recommendation, everyone here is a, a lot of people here are real cinephiles. They love films. We're going to show four documentaries here again this summer, like we do every summer. This is our sixth year. Yes, this sir. is our sixth year of summer docs. I'm excited to say, and uh, we've shown some great films. Yeah, no. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if there's a film you saw recently, Matt, that you would recommend. What's a film you liked? Well, there are three movies off the top of my head that, that I can recommend. Um, one of them is, strangely enough, considering how I bashed these kinds of movies, is uh, Godzilla. <laughs> I, I'm serious. I've seen this movie three times now. You're here to recommend Godzilla I was, to us? yeah. I was. If you, and don't lie. Some of you have seen it already. Um, now, wh now, why did you like Godzilla? Because, because everybody it, in my it, world is 50-50 on Godzilla. It, well, it reminded me of being, uh, being uh, 10 years old and seeing Close Encounters of the Third Kind w for the first time. And, it's, and it's, that, it's an experience movie. And that's a phrase, actually, when I talk to movies, when I talk to Chaz about movies on the phone, like the reviews that I've written and things, she'll sometimes use, say that was an experience about a movie that she liked. And, 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 and that's something I think Roger was into as well. But um, there's another one called Under the Skin. It's a science fiction film uh, with Scarlett Johansson by the director of a movie, uh, Birth. <laughs> well, I said if my... If, What's uh, his name again, the guy that did Birth? Uh, Jonathan Glazer. Right. And also oh, um, Sexy Beast. He directed that too. He did Sexy Beast with Ben? Yeah. The same guy that did uh, uh, mm -hmm. Birth? Yeah, How very versa very versatile. Yes, yes indeed. Oh my god. Birth yeah. screened at the Hamptons Film Festival ten years ago or so. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. And uh, and I just saw this little movie called Coherence. It's a science fiction film. It looks like it was made for about eight dollars. Uh, and it's all done. It's all a matter of implication. Uh, and it reminded me of a Twilight Zone, like a 50s Twilight Zone movie. Like the oh, these, have, these have distribution? They're coming out? Yeah, it, well, this one, Coherence, just opened, actually. And it's, uh, it reminded me of The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street. If you're of a certain generation, you'll know that episode that I'm talking about. It's really creepy. And we, I would recommend a movie called Bell, if you haven't seen it, based on a, a true story of a, of a daughter of a slave and uh, an admiral in England who actually... Uh, her case helped 
in, in some of the legislation, helped enact some of the legislation that ended slavery in England. It's, um, it's a beautiful costume piece, but it's also, you know, also has some depth. It's uh, beautiful. And another one that it's not in the movies now, you may have to look for it on, I don't know, Netflix or somewhere, but Le Weekend. That's a good one. What's that about? It's about uh, a couple, uh, an, a British couple who've been married for about 30 years, and on their 30th wedding anniversary, they're going to Paris to celebrate their uh, marriage, but the wife really wants a divorce, and they run into Jeff Goldblum in Paris, which <laughs> becomes so eccentric. Uh, it is so, it's a very entertaining movie. I love Jeff Goldblum because you say his name, it's like, and they run into Jeff Goldblum, and like half the people are mentally like, I I'm sold, sold. <laughs> and David Nugent, have you got a one or two? Um, Boyhood is coming out in a couple of weeks by Rick Linklater, which, uh, you know, the director of Dazed and Confused and Bernie and the Before Midnight and Sunrise and Sunset and all those movies. It's a movie he'd been making for 12 years now. Uh, uh, it sort of chronicles a, a young boy who's growing up and he started filming him when he was, I, I think, about five. And in the end of the movie, he's 17 and they went back every summer and filmed for a couple of weeks in the summer. And uh, you see this boy grow up on camera, and it stars uh, Ethan Hawke and Patricia Arquette, and it's an absolutely magical movie. That comes out, I think, in a couple of weeks. Oh, and can I put in a word for a movie that played at Ebert Fest this year? Uh, a movie called Museum Hours by Jem Cohen, which is one of the best experiences I've ever had in a theater, and it reminded me of a movie that Roger loved and loved and would not stop talking about and reviewing, My Dinner with Andre. It's almost, it feels like My Dinner with Andre, but in a museum. What about you, Alec? My recommendation, I went to Spain with my wife last year and I shot the fifth installment of the Torrente comedy series in Spain. I am one of the stars of Torrente Cinco. <laughs> in which uh, Santiago Segura plays the racist, sexist, corrupt police officer in Spain and I am his nemesis in the film, but it's like an Ocean's Eleven parody. It's going to be one of the greatest comedy films of all time. <laughs> Torrente Cinco, coming in Europe this fall, in October. Anyway, thank you all for coming. We'll see thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.